Hey, everyone. I hope you're having a good Wednesday. It is Tracy coming to you live from New Hampshire Dog Walking Club headquarters, and I am here with Dr. Boyer. How are you, Dr. Boyer? Hey, I'm great. How are you? Thank you very well. I appreciate you joining again, joining us again tonight for another Ask the Veterinarian series. This has been a very popular series, and we have a lot of questions that were submitted for tonight. And I think you and I were discussing beforehand that we were seeing an ongoing trend specifically with allergies and also with kennel cough. Yep. So I know we're going to spend a little bit of time on that tonight. So that'll be good. Excellent. So now, if you are watching live, feel free to ask additional questions. We do have a hard stop at 730 and we do have a lot of questions to get through. However, uh, additional questions that are posted tonight, we will hold them over to the August Ask the Veterinarian series. So please feel free to post them. And if you are listening on the replay, again, post your questions as well. Uh, it's helpful if you can put Ask the Veterinarian hashtag so we can easily search for them. And then we will include them on a future episode as well. So Dr. Borey, before we get into it, can you tell everybody a little bit about you? Because you kind of have a specialty when it comes to the veterinary world. Tell us about yourself. So I've been a practicing veterinarian for about 20 years. Um, my special areas of interest are emergency medicine predominantly, and then canine sports and sports medicine. I, I am a breeder um, of two different kinds of dogs that are very um, athletic. So I do a, a lot of um, focus in that way. And then I'm also in something you may not know, I'm in the process of getting a working dog practitioner certification through uh, one of the uh, Penn State, uh, or sorry, Penn State uh, Continuing Education. And so what that means is that I, the classwork that I'm taking is geared towards not just military dogs, but service dogs, um, dogs that have a, a purpose uh, and that are actually working dogs, whether it's herding, scent detection, police dogs, you know, guide dogs, things like that. So, yeah, I'm kind of got an eclectic background. I do some forensics work, uh, especially when it comes to animal abuse. I've done investigations there and I'm a court qualified expert in some other areas. But, um, you know, I know a lot about a lot of things, but I know, but my areas predominantly are, are related to, you know, dogs and cats. I don't do any exotic work or anything like that. Um, you know, I used to work on cows and horses, but the body doesn't take that anymore. So <laughs> just dogs, mostly my, my passion is dogs. Um, and so, I mean, I love cats too, but dogs really kind of have my heart and I like to learn everything I can about them. So, well, we're very grateful for your time. I know how busy the veterinary industry is, uh, especially in the, um, post COVID, uh, landscape. So again, every month when you come to us live for an hour, very valuable information, very helpful to people. So again, thank you. I don't, I don't think I can thank you enough. So. <laughs> it's actually my pleasure and it's kind of one way I can give back. Um, and it, it really actually keeps me on my toes and I really enjoy the interaction with people and the fact that people need this information and it's a great venue to get it out to everybody. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. So why don't we start right off if we can with the first question, which um, gets us on the topic of allergies in our pets this year. Are you seeing that this year has been different than any other year as far as an increase in allergies in pets? You know, I don't know that it's an increase, but I think um, people are with their pets a lot more and maybe they're noticing it more in some ways because of COVID and they're not going out as much. But, you know, certainly we've had a lot of things with all the rain, there's a lot more blooming and a lot different kind of growth to all of the flora. And, you know, with allergies, it's never one thing that a dog is allergic to or people in, in general, it's kind of this, you know, you might be allergic, let's say to, um, let's say you're, you're allergic to oak, for example, or pine. Um, and one year, you know, that's the only thing in the environment that you come in contact with. Well, your allergies may not be so bad. And then the next year, you know, you, there's something else you're allergic to and that happens to bloom. And then it just kind of, you know, keeps going up and up and up. So it's kind of like you have this threshold of, you know, when you're going to have symptoms or not, and you can handle a little bit of stimulation, your immune system can handle a little, and then there's another item that comes in and makes it a little worse. And then the pollens come in and make it a little worse. And then finally, you just break over the threshold where the combined effect of whatever the allergens are, make that pet more symptomatic than they would be. So yes, we always see a lot of pets for allergies all the time. I don't know that I've had a massive increase um, 
but I but I'd say you know with all the rain it wouldn't surprise me because we've had a big change in our in all of the vegetation around um, and you know pets are allergic to either something in the environment like an inhaled allergen where there's something in the air they inhale kind of like when we get hay fever or they might have a contact allergen something they come in contact with on their skin or they could have a food allergy or some combination of all three. So it would depend on how sensitized their immune system is as to whether they break with allergies. So for the person who asked the question about congestion, um, the one thing that I would say is maybe it's allergy, but maybe it's not. Um, there's a host of respiratory issues that we're seeing in the area. Lately, um, a lot of um, upper respiratory infections that you know, people might think are allergy that they're really not. And there's also fungal disease that can cause congestion or, you know, we might, you know, there's other reasons that pets can be congested. So if the congestion is, let's say both nostrils, that's the first question I would think about. If, is it equal on both sides? If it's not equal on both sides, then I would definitely schedule an exam with your veterinarian. There are things like simple things that, that are not horrible, but like maybe even a nasal polyp that can cause congestion on one side. You know, if you have a benign little growth up in the nasal passage, or they could have some inflammation or irritation because there's maybe a piece of grass up there that's been up there for a long time or something else that's causing that congestion, or there could be an, an infection or it could be an allergy. And so when someone comes to me and says, hey, my dog is congested, we're gonna start with, is it really an allergy or not? And we're gonna go through a series of history. I'm gonna take a look at the nostrils, what's going on up there. Sometimes we have to do a sedated exam where we actually look up with a little scope and see what the, the deeper passages look like. It just depends on how long it's been going on and do they have a fever or not? I mean, there's a whole host of things that it can be. Interesting, so. okay. <clears throat> well, what about if the dog is uh, scratching, licking sure. front paws, biting it back paws? Yep, uh, that is. Would you right. recommend supplements at all? Well, I recommend a few things. Um, you know, the first thing is, is if dogs have ear infections chronically, and they are having the itching and the scratching and the biting of the back paws, typically what started off as an allergy may have progressed to by breaking down that that skin barrier. So, for example, the dog is scratching or licking or biting then they can't, you know, they break that skin barrier down that's protective. And what comes in underneath that is bacteria and yeast and sometimes skin mites. There are a lot of skin mites out there. And so it might take what started as an allergy and now we have an allergy plus infection. And you're never going to get ahead of the itching, the scratching, the licking if we don't treat the infection as well. So um, there are supplements in general, but if a dog is licking its paws, um, aside from the inhaled allergens, it also could be a food allergy. And so we talk about atopy, which is your inhaled allergens predominantly. That's allergies to environment and something going on in the environment. And then we have, you know, food allergies are kind of a separate category. And dogs can have both. You can have inhaled allergens and you can have a food allergen. Um, with the inhaled allergens, the first thing is, is if the skin is at all red, moist, um, and the continual scratching and itching is to make sure, number one, that they're on a really good flea and tick medication. And when someone would come to see me for that, the first thing is, is I try to get them, if the dog is able to use this flea and tick medication on something that's the oral medication like Brevecto, Nexgard, um, or even um, Simperica Trio, because that's the only one that will also get skin mites. And here in New Hampshire, we have a lot of dogs that have skin mites. Mm -hmm. And that also can cause an itch. Um, if you came to me with a dog that was itching and licking paws and things, I would also then do something called skin cytology where I take like little, I take actually like some um, packing tape or like clear scotch tape, put it on the skin, take it off, put that on a slide. And then I'm looking for bacteria and yeast mm -hmm. because if there's bacteria and yeast there, we're never going to get rid of this itching until that's gone. So most dogs who have itching and scratching that have bacterial yeast, they really don't need oral antibiotics or oral antifungals unless it's really, really bad. You can use topical shampoos. Um, there are shampoos that are medicated for to be anti-yeast and antibacterial. And you would then make sure that those paws, you know, especially were clean, dry, um, you know, you know they probably bathe three times a week temporarily to get rid of the bacteria and the yeast. And then we go to treat the allergy as well. 
So to do the supplements, um, in terms of a natural thing, the first thing I do is vitamin E is a natural and he has kind of like a natural anti-inflammatory. So vitamin E is very safe. You can buy the human grade vitamin E. It can be broke, you know, pinched or broken open on or snipped off the tip and just squirted on the food. Um, that's one thing that can help calm allergies. Things like Benadryl, which isn't a supplement, um, the, you know, over the counter antihistamines work in about 30% of dogs. So the majority of dogs, it's not going to help. Okay. Um, so it's worth a try. You can try sometimes Claritin is safe, depending, you have to get the d correct dosing for the size of the dog, but I've used Claritin, Zyrtec and Benadryl. Those are all safe in dogs, um, at the right dose. Um, and so that might be helpful, but 70% of dogs, it's not going to make a difference. And so then we kind of have to, unfortunately get into a, we make sure there's no infection and then B, what are we going to do about the allergy? So, the first thing I always do is, okay, are we, do we have a food allergy or an environmental allergy? Let's see if we can discern that. And there's, it's a lot of trial and error sometimes. Um, you can go to a veterinary dermatologist who can actually do skin testing, like the intradermal testing that people have, the scratch testing. You can also, there is a blood panel from a company called HESCA that is allergy testing. There's questionable about the reliability of it, um, but in general, some people find that really helpful to narrow the field of what your dog's allergic to. But most of the time I find, even if you know what it is, unless it's a food, you can't really control it anyway. You know, I mean, so it's kind of like, is it gonna really help us? Um, so allergies, we tend to treat with several different kinds of things. Some uh, veterinarians, I, I know people on the questions have referred to like Cytopoint and Cytopoint is an injection that you uh, the dog would get every three, to um, you know, three to four weeks, it's a um, immunomodulator. And so it lower, it basically kind of takes the immune system and quiets it down. Mm -hmm. it, and, but it's, and it's, it can be immunosuppressive, but not to the level where you have to worry that the dog is gonna get other infections. Cytopoint is safe uh, generally in most dogs. Um, if it's going to work, it starts working within 24 hours. And the times that I see that it doesn't work are when we have infections that aren't being treated at the same time. Um, so, you know, you kind of want to do both. Um, some dogs though, it doesn't work for. I think that the statistic is maybe 20% of dogs, Cytopoint's not enough. Some people use Apoquel, which is also on that list up there. Apoquel is a drug that is another immunomodulator, immunosuppressant. It works very well, safe in most dogs expensive as is Cytopoint. I mean, these are not inexpensive things depending on the weight of the dog. So for big dogs, these can be cost prohibitive for some people. So, um, you know, Cytopoint in a big dog can be, you know, $100 for an injection. And so then, or even more depending on the size of that dog. So every month to do that, to keep the allergies back, that's pretty tough. Um, Apoquel can be that or more. And sometimes people combine Apoquel and Cytopoint. There is a less expensive alternative that can be tried called cyclosporin or atopica. Atopica, again, another immunosuppressant. Um, it's used in a, a wide variety of, of um, diseases, but atopica will work. Um, there's a generic alternative, which makes it a lot less expensive. Um, sometimes it's um, equal to apoquel and cytopoint, sometimes not, it's variable. And then the last kind of medical medication that we try is steroids, which is not a great alternative for long-term treatment, but to get a dog over the hump, you know, when they're just insanely itchy, I might do Cytopoint in a 10 day course of steroids, and then we wean them off the steroids and then they're, they're fine. They've kind of gotten the, the threshold down. The long-term steroid use has a lot of negative side effects. Dogs will drink a lot, they'll pee a lot, they'll pant at rest. It affects every organ system in the body. And so, you know, we never want to leave them on it long-term, but there are some dogs who that's the only way they can survive and be comfortable. Um, so if there's a dog that's at that point, that's when we go to a dermatologist because then there's another treatment that they can do there, which is hyposensitization. So Dermatologists can actually do put together what the, they do allergy testing, figure out what the dog's allergic to. And um, you know how people get allergy shots yeah. where it's the same thing in dogs where they can get shots like once a week, it's a package made specifically for whatever your dog's allergic to. And it's micro doses of the thing that sets them off. And then they build that tolerance over time. And it, ta it's, it takes a while, but it is 
it works in a lot of dogs. So that would be hyposensitization is another option. And then um, making sure it's not a food contribution um, because the food issue is, is really important. So people will come in and say, oh, you know, my dogs, will, I, I think it's the food, and I'll be, but I changed foods and it's still itchy. And I'd say, well, changing foods isn't what is going to tell us whether your dog's allergic to food because it's not the brand. It's not just the protein in the food. It's not just the carbohydrate in the food. They could be allergic to any component that's in that food. So typically what we recommend is something called a hydrolyzed diet, which is a, it's, it's a prescription diet. It's not cheap, but we don't have to do it forever. We do eight weeks of a food trial. And so hydrolyzed diet means that that protein is broken down already from protein into amino acids. So the body can't mount an immune response to it. There's no possible way for that dog to be allergic to what's in that food. It's pretty incredible. And so if you put that a dog on a hydrolyzed diet for eight weeks and nothing passes that dog's lips except water and that food, and it comes canned, it comes dry, they make treats that are hydrolyzed as well. At the end of eight weeks, if the dog is better, you know there's a food component to this. Right. So then we go and look for a single source protein like, that they've never been exposed to. So maybe venison or rabbit or you know something that they've never eaten before and try them on that diet to see if then they can tolerate that. And if they don't break with the allergy, there's your diagnosis. But it is a long process to do that. And it can be frustrating to an owner. Well, and I know some of some simple things you can do right off the bat. If you're a smoker or if you burn mm -hmm. candles in your house, if you use air fresheners yep. or different things like that, that could irritate dogs, um, olfactory senses. It's great to eliminate those things as, as much as you can get as get rid of as many volatile organic compounds as mm -hmm. possible. And, you know, that's a good place to start. We actually had a member that was experiencing her dog was experiencing quite a lot of problems with mm -hmm. sneezing and congestion and she figured out it was due to candles she was burning absolutely so, you know that's one easy way to eliminate some options there and sure. um, if you're not doing any of that stuff then obviously there's something else there and and these are all some great uh, recommendations so i appreciate that yeah I mean, it's it's you have to look at the environment and has anything changed in the environment and then the other yeah. thing i always ask is like is this seasonal is your dog perfectly fine in the winter? And now that we're in the spring and summer, is this when this starts? And because if there's a seasonal component to it, then that's a whole nother thing. And, you know, you'll find dogs get hot spots right now. Um, and, you know, hot spots, we always say, okay, are they on a good flea and tick? Because that's usually where it starts. They, they can be on a flea and tick, but get a flea bite, like one bite. And that's enough. If you're allergic to fleas, that's enough to set off those hot spots. And so hot spots really can be treated a lot at home, which is great. I mean, we see them all the time, but if you catch it quickly, a lot of times you can don't need to go to the vet, which is, would be lovely for everybody. Um, if you can get the fur trimmed back with some clippers to where you see normal skin and use some antibacterial soap and water on that hot spot, if your dog will let you do that. And then there's an over-the-counter spray, which is my go-to for you know, superficial wound infections or, or things called vetricin. It's um, V, I, can, I don't know if you want to put it up on the screen. It's V-E-T-E-R-I-C-Y-N or vetricin plus. You can buy it at Tractor Supply, PetSmart. Um, you know, most pet stores will sell it. Um, if you can't find the dog one, you can always look in the horse if they have an equine aisle. Yep, there it is. Yep. That is something every dog owner should have at home. Okay. It's really great to treat um, like staph infections, which is what most of these are in wounds. It's a very good topical. Some of them even have a little calming spray to take the pain and itch away. So that's an excellent thing to try before, you know, if you just notice a hot spot brewing, you clip the fur back, wash and dry the area really well and spray vetricin on it. If you do that consistently and keep it clean and dry and then add that, you probably will avoid a vet visit. Excellent. Okay, great advice. All right, yeah. moving along on our questions here. Let's see. Uh, there's been a lot of... Uh, questions about kennel cough. There was uh, a daycare recently that had sent out an announcement that um, there was a lot of kennel cough running through the dogs coming into their area. So if we could talk a little bit about that. So for instance, um, somebody asked, my dog recently contracted kennel cough. 
The vaccine only covers the viral, but my vet prescribed antibiotics. Why is this if what they catch while vaccinated is bacteria? Well, that's a good, very good question. So typically, um, kennel cough can have a lot of, kennel cough really is a big broad term meant to describe what's called infectious tracheitis or an infectious upper respiratory infection like a cold in people. And in dogs, Bordetella is what we vaccinate for. And Bordetella, there are three types of Bordetella vaccines. One is given as an injection under the skin, one is given in the nose, and one is given in the mouth. Um, it depends on what your vet uses as to which one your dog gets. I personally find that um, the ones under the skin are not as effective because it's um, a killed virus, not a modified live virus. You usually have to have two injections to bring the immune system up for it. And it doesn't, I don't think any of them really last more than about eight months. Um, most people, it's an annual vaccine for the dog. But, um, and, and that's kind of because that's the most, you know, people aren't going to come back in every six months to get it done. But I find the efficacy really starts to lag at about eight, 10 months. So if you have a dog that's out with a lot of other dogs, you might want to boost that more frequently. But that's Bordetella is just one component of what can cause kennel cough. There are dozens of other pathogens, whether it's bacterial or viral, that can be identified as being a component of kennel cough. So there is a test that runs, oh, depending on your vet, $150. What, like if you came in for kennel cough, I might do a swab of the tonsils and of the nasal passages and send that into the lab to see what which is, what is that respiratory disease caused by? Because it may not clear, you know, by itself. And so Bordetella in general or kennel cough in general is a self-limiting disease. If the dog is not, doesn't have a fever and they're eating and drinking fine, um, keep them isolated from other dogs and it should go away. And you can use some over-the-counter cough suppressants. Um, I'll talk to you about two that are really good. Um, and then but if they're, they have a fever, they're not eating, they're not drinking, they're really punky, they have lots of discharge coming out of their nose, or they're coughing so much that they're vomiting, which is very common, um, then you need, definitely would probably need a little help. And when you have a compromised immune system, even though it's viral, sometimes they get a secondary bacterial infection that's contributing to it, or they have two pathogens, virus and a bacteria. So the the question that was asked is correct. You know, if it's just viral, those antibiotics are not going to be helpful. But if it's bacterial, it will be. And we don't know up front which it was. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we put dogs on like doxycycline because that's the most effective one we found for most of the pathogens that cause the upper respiratory disease. Um, now, when you have a dog that gets kennel cough, they got it seven to 10 days before. That incubation period is about a week before they came down with symptoms. Okay. So they were somewhere where they came in contact with the, with those viruses or bacteria, they picked it up and it's transmissible through food and water dishes, the hands of groomers, the hands of people who are handling your dog, nose to nose contact with other dogs. It's aerosolized. So it can be anywhere. And then they are, you know, it takes about seven to 10 days. I think the minimum I've seen it is three days. And then, you know, so three to three to 10 days, they come down with symptoms. Well, in that meantime, you've now exposed a bunch of other dogs because you didn't know your dog had it and they're still shedding that virus. And they're going to shed that virus for about a week after the last symptoms are gone. So you should not expose your dog to other dogs for at least seven to 10 days to be safe after you know, your dog doesn't have symptoms anymore. So my benchmarks for when you need to see your vet would be coughing that keeps the dog up to where none, no, none of you are getting any rest or coughing that causes vomiting. Okay. Kennel cough that, do, that is not getting better within a few days. If it's not starting to get better within a few days, it may not be kennel cough. It could be bronchitis, which is a very different treatment. If the dog has a fever, if they're not eating, they're not drinking, or they're just really punky, they probably need to be seen for some help. Now, if it's just coughing and they're otherwise okay, um, there's a product, you can buy it on Amazon called Cough Tabs. And what, um, and I don't know if you can pull that up, Tracy, like the product is called Cough Tabs for Dogs. It's, um, it's a guafenicin, which is kind of like an over-the-counter robitussin, but it's in a small pill form, so I like it a little better. And those are over the, the counter, and people can have those, and you don't need your vet, you can get those. And those help with a lot of coughs from a lot of reasons. Now, Robitussin DM is also safe, but check with your vet because there's so many DM formulations and there's different dosing regimens. So there's, you know, you have to check with your vet for the dosing 
that particular, you know, your Robitussin DM. So if you're going to get the liquid, put that up, you know, send a note to your vet and say, hey, can I give this to my dog? I think they have kennel cough and they'll tell you whether that particular one is safe. Cough tabs for sure are safe. Um, so, um, you know, it's, we have a flare right now. There's no question. I'm seeing maybe, I don't know, probably four or five kennel cough cases a day on average. And, and it's not, and I don't think I've ever seen that many in a small period of time lately. So um, if your dog's vaccinated, the good news is, is if they get sick, it's usually much shorter duration. So that is a benefit of the vaccine, even though you can't vaccinate for every pathogen, it's only vaccinating for one. I find those dogs that are vaccinated won't be sick as bad and not as long as the dogs that aren't vaccinated at all. So hopefully that. that yeah. Out. Well, I wanted to ask you too, because I've heard that honey can provide some relief for dogs with kennel cough. Have you heard of that? Yeah. I mean, you can give a little, it soothes the throat, you know, there's, you know, the throat, you have these stretch receptors in your, in the neck that trigger a cough, you know, it's kind of the things that will trigger it. So anything like that, that can soothe. The other thing I find that can soothe the throat too is, um, marshmallow root powder and mix that in water. And that actually helps the stomach lining too, because it's, um, you know, when dogs have kennel cough and they're swallowing that mucus that goes down the back of their throat that irritates the lining of the stomach. And that's why they vomit that white foam. Yep. So if you take like a little bit of, you could use even a little bit of um, Maalox too, would kind of coat and soothe that the esophagus, right? And coat and soothe the stomach. But I like marshmallow root is very soothing as well as honey. Oh, so what a great idea. to mix it in water and that works really well. Okay. And is that a taste that dogs will like? I'm not yep. actually sure what the flavor is. Okay. It's pretty, it's fairly bland. Yeah. They don't okay. care. It's just, it's a little gooey, you know, when you yep. mix it with water, but you can syringe it right in or, you know, sometimes they'll just drink it out of the bowl. Oh, huh. works okay. really well. Really interesting. Okay. Yeah. But cough yeah. for dogs is great. That's a great product for dogs who have, if you have a dog that has like a chronic cough in general, I and mean, for another reason, that's an, an alternative medicine for some some dogs. Just check with your vet, depending on the circumstance of their illness, whether that would be an appropriate one to use. But it's very safe in most circumstances. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, what about spaying your dog? Do you have any thoughts on regular spaying versus laparoscopic spaying? Oh yeah, I've got tons of thoughts about it. It's great, actually. That's a wonderful question. I'm glad somebody actually asked that. Um, so I know, you know, people try to be very, very responsible and spay and neuter their pets. And then we have other people who um, are maybe um, a little bit concerned about the hormonal influences and when the right time to spay is. And I, we've talked about that in the past about, you know, should we spay and neuter our dogs at, before their first heat cycles or later? And the trend is to, in many breeds, not all breeds, but in many breeds, the trend is to wait to spay a dog when they're a little bit older, when they reach full skeletal maturity, especially in those dogs that are athletes, you know, the athletic dogs. Um, there are benefits to that. So the problem then is when you go to spay a dog that is, you know, 70 or 80 pounds, that's a lot bit more traumatic and more traumatic on your vet too, because it's a harder surgery, um, you know, to spay a 70 pound dog versus a, you know, 20 pound dog. So laparoscopic spaying is a, actually a different procedure. So an irregular spay, it's called an ovariohysterectomy. You take out the ovaries and you take out the uterus, okay? So the dog doesn't go into heat anymore. There's no cycling and the ovaries and the uterus are gone. So there's no cancer, future cancer of the reproductive tract. That surgery requires, depending on your surgeon, an incision that can be anywhere from an inch and a half to larger, okay? Um, it's a bigger surgery because, you know, your, um, the incision is bigger. You're going in and you're manipulating, um, the uterus, you're manipulating the, or the, the ovaries, you're tying them off with suture, you know, ligatures generally. And there are sometimes complications from those surgeries. Unfortunately, it, it's hard to avoid. Sometimes, you know, a ligature could slip, things can happen. If you have a dog that's obese or has a lot of intra-abdominal fat, things can happen. Um, and it, when you spay a dog, you're kind of doing it not blindly, but you um, can't, you don't have a, you know, it's not like the abdomen is wide open and you have a view of everything that you're doing. A lot of it's done by feel and you have to be very careful not to entrap like a ureter in your ligature. You know, you have to really know what you, you have to watch and be careful. And most veterinarians are very good at this surgery. Um, and so that's kind of a regular spay and the recovery period, you know, with a regular spay is 10 to 14 days. 
Um, you know, once the sutures are dissolved, everything's good. Your dog wears an e-collar um, and they, and you know, it's, it's something that can be, the pain levels are, are, you know, it's not a very comfortable surgery, but there's pain medication that goes home to help the dog do fine. Laparoscopic spaying, on the other hand, uses a, a laparoscope as an instrument that's put into the dog with a, like, you know, a half inch incision. So two small incisions, maybe. Um, and you have the laparoscope and then you have the, you know, your, your tools that you use, your instruments that you use. And you only take out the ovaries. You don't take out the uterus. Um, so what happens is they use a thing called a ligature and it's almost like a clamp that goes around the, the ovaries. You clamp off the blood flow there, you clamp off the blood flow the other. The ovaries removed with the tool and it's taken out through the port on the camera. I mean, they're small and they can come out that way. If the dog doesn't have any ovaries, they, they don't have a heat cycle, okay? And they don't, you know, so that the heat cycles are gone, they can't get pregnant, right? But their uterus is still there. Now, people might say, oh, well, but then they're still at risk for uterine cancer or pyometras. Well, no, they're not. We know in Europe, most dogs are spayed laparoscopically or they have a long history of laparoscopic spay. And laparoscopic spay, um, we don't see any increased risk of pyometra or increased risk of um, uterine tumors. It's, I think the percentage is like 0.003% of a dog would get like a uterine tumor by leaving the uterus. So it's a very low risk. And so I think that it's a, it's a safer procedure from the standpoint of you can see with that camera, I, you get a really great view of the entire abdomen. So you know exactly what you're doing. It's very visible. Um, it's smaller, smaller incisions, smaller, you know, smaller trauma to the abdomen, easier healing from the surgery. The downside to a laparoscopic spay is cost. It's more expensive. And there aren't that many veterinarians who do that because if you have a vet who does a lot of spays, they spay, you know, they can do a spay in a fa in fairly short time to invest in the equipment to do a laparoscopic spay is going to probably add three to $500 to each procedure, at least plus the training of the veterinarian plus, plus, plus. So, you know, and they're going to be slower at it initially until they get up to speed and being able to do it. So, um, if you have a veterinarian who's skilled with laparoscopic spaying, and most of the specialists are, like, I mean, you'd have to go to specialists, it might take what's a $400 or $500 spay, and I don't even know what the cost of a spay is anymore on regular dogs, but I'm guessing four-ish, hundred or more, it might turn it into like a $1,000 spay. So if money's not a problem, oh, I would always opt for the laparoscope <laughs> because it's just a, it's a better procedure. But um, if the money is concerning, the dog needs to be spayed, then I would do that. Wow. Yeah. Well, that, I had no idea. I'd never even heard of laparoscopic uh, spaying. So that's really interesting. Do you know anybody in this area that actually specializes in that? There are some people. Um, I will tell you, it's also sometimes called an OSS spay, an ovary sparing spay. Or that's a, well, that's a different one. There's something called an ovary sparing spay, too. That's another, a whole other way to do it. But the laparoscopic, I want to say Broadview Veterinary Clinic might do it in Dover. Um, only because they do a lot of reproductive work and I think they do laparoscopic there, but okay. I'm not sure. And then any of the, the like, I'm sure that Port City and some of the other ones that have specialist surgeons do it. And I'm fairly new to the area still, so I don't know anybody else at this point, but there are, um, there are definitely benefits to it. And it, if you put, I know that you can Google laparoscopic spay in New Hampshire and there'll be, it'll come up pretty easily with, people who do it okay but but yeah if you have an option to do that and, and the money it's reasonable for you for cost I think it's definitely worth exploring okay good to know yeah. all right so switching gears again can right. you first define what canine cognitive dysfunction is and then what are some recommendations for a 13 year old dog with CCD that's a great question um, so canine cognitive dysfunction is just to compare it to people is like senility or, you know, a little dementia. They're get, they're starting to lose their mental capacity a bit and get confused. Some dogs as they age, get very anxious. I would say that's another, another issue too. They get extremely anxious. Um, uh, they may not, you know, they may kind of just see like they're not aware of their surroundings for a while and then they kind of come back or um, they'll see a behavior change. It's more like senility. Um, and there are a lot of things that you can do for it, actually, and I, and I think it's important. So the first thing is if your dog has um, 
if you think your dog has CCD, I would say, let's make sure we have baseline blood work to make sure everything is normal. Otherwise, no problems with liver, kidneys, thyroid, blood pressure, you know, all of those things. Um, just make sure the parameters are normal. And then um, the first thing is there's a great food on the market by Purina called Bright Minds. And Purina Pro Plan Bright Minds, it's not a prescription. You can buy it at any of the pet stores. Um, that has a very, it's a very well researched diet and it has a unique blend of medium chain triglycerides and DHEA and a few other, um, you know, fatty acids. And what's great about that is the dogs that I've, when people come to me and tell me about their dog and what's happening, I say, before we do anything else, if the dog's not allergic to chicken, that's the only thing it has chicken in it. Um, and I have like, I have a dog I'd love to put on that diet, but it only comes in chicken. So, and even, and if it has a different, I think they have maybe one other formulation that they say salmon that still has chicken in it. If you read the label, so it's just not an option for a chicken allergic dog. Um, that food, you put that dog in that food in two to three weeks, you have a different dog. I mean, it's, it's dramatic. And, and my experience with this is that's the first thing I do. Um, then sometimes I'll use things like anti-anxiety medication for dogs, whether that's, um, a, a lot of times dogs who have sun, they get like a sundowner syndrome at night. Um, like my dog, I know for me with my older girl, it's 14. She starts getting anxious at about eight, nine o'clock at night. So we use melatonin and melatonin is wonderful at night with dogs with CCD. You, in a large dog, you can do about three milligrams of melatonin, though just the human over the counter stuff. And that tends to help calm anxiety at night. Um, so if it's a nighttime thing, definitely you can try that. And then sometimes we have to then up the ante to things like um, anti-anxiety med medications or um, sometimes a combination of different things. And then there's another medication uh, called selegiline, which is actually meant for canine cognitive dysfunction that can be prescribed by your veterinarian. So there's a variety of things that can be done, but in terms of over the counter, I always try, you know, try the food, try some melatonin. Some people have reported luck with CBD. I'm, I'm not such a, I don't think it works that well for that. Um, it, you know, it can work for other things, but you know, that is something some people will try. Make sure it does not have THC in it. That's you know a no go with dogs. But um, you know that's kind of where I would start from a an easy thing to start with. It's something simple to try. And then if that's not enough, then I would definitely talk with your vet about some prescription medications because there's several options available. Okay, excellent. Yep. How about when you're feeding your dog? Do you feel raised dog bowl holders work? And what about those bowls that are supposed to slow down eating? Do they work as well? So I would tell you that it would depend on your dog, whether I would recommend a raised dog bowl feeder. The biggest issue with a raised dog bowl feeder is there's something called canine bloat or gastric dilatation volvulus. So that's when a dog will, its stomach will rotate on its axis and the dog will, the abdomen will get really big and they die. And that's a very serious disease in deep chested, large breed dogs. So, if you have a large breed dog with a deep chest, then I would say absolutely do not use a raised dog bowl holder because that it represents several hundred time increase in risk of getting a gastric torsion by re feeding from an elevated feeder. And that's scientifically proven. So if you have a dog, if you have a little dog or you have a dog that's 30 pounds or something or 40 pounds, but it doesn't have a deep chest conformation, then yeah, raised feeders are fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with it, but when you get, to that, you know, Great Dane, Doberman, Rottweiler, my, my wire head pointing Griffons that are big deep chested dogs, um, Dalmatians, um, any other dog that kind of has that confirmation or that's at risk for bloat. I mean, there's certain breeds that are at risk for bloat if, and especially if bloat was in their lines, let's say you have a purebred that has a history of family members with bloat, um, you know, Borzois, for example, you wouldn't want to use it in a Borzois or something like that, or, you know, a sight hound, the larger sight hounds. Um, I would not use that, but otherwise they're fine. Um, the slow feed bowls do slow down eating. And that's an interesting thing because there's, um, I have dogs that inhale their food so fast then they throw it up because they eat too fast. I, th they work great. They're, um, you know, they have a little track. It makes them work harder to get their food out of their bowl. They have to eat slow. You can also float their food in a little bit of water that will slow them down a bit too. Um, but slow feed bowls work well. It doesn't prevent bloat though, interestingly enough. The research doesn't show that a slow feed bowl will prevent bloat because it's not an issue of eating too fast. 
Um, you know, there's, I have an article, a blog article that I'll be more than happy to link you to that I wrote for the German short haired pointer club recently. That's all about bloat and all of the things you can do to prevent bloat and, um, and what the risk factors are. And I, I can link you to that blog article. Maybe you want to put it up on the, the dog walking club yeah. uh, page. I Interesting. Think cool. So but. you're saying that just the difference, if I understood you correctly, just the difference in them eating from a food bowl that's on the floor versus it being raised. Yes. Makes the difference in some of those large breeds. Yes. Really? What, what is yep. it just because they have to work a little harder to get it in or? You know, I don't know that we know, but I think the research itself, I don't know that they know the mechanism, but, and it may be, you know, how much air they're inhaling versus how they swallow when it's from an elevated feeder. But it represents, I want to say, oh, I have to look at the, I don't know the exact statistic off the top of my head, but I want to say like a 200% increase in risk for bloat if you feed from an elevated feeder for those dogs at risk. It's a very large, large increase. Yeah, so I, I think um, that that article you wrote would be very helpful mm -hmm. for people. Sure. We have a lot of members with uh, with larger dogs. So, mm -hmm. okay, so we'll make sure that we get that posted. Yeah, I'll get that to you tonight so you yeah, can post it up there. Note here to Make sure. sure we get that part article posted. Okay, great. All right, so let's see here. We've got a couple other questions that'll probably round off our hour here. Great. So since we're on the conversation of eating, what dog food do you recommend for small dogs? What is your recommendation for picky eaters? Wow, I could do a whole hour on dog food. <laughs> okay, so, um, and I'll try not to show too much of my bias. Um, and and let me let me first give you a disclaimer. I receive nothing from pet food companies. Okay, so let's let's start with that. I do not get any money from Hills, Purina, Royal Canin, any of the big pet food companies. And my viewpoints are strictly my own. Okay, and I based on my research and my experience. Um, I personally don't think there is a right food for all small dogs, and that each dog is unique. But there are things that, and some dogs will do better on some foods than they will do on others. So when you have a young dog that's growing, um, you know, uh, Purina Pro Plan Focus is probably one of the best formulated dog foods for puppies out there. Not every dog does well on it though. You know, it, it depends on their digestion and, and their activity level. So that's one food I really am, am very big on because I've raised litters of dogs. I'm a breeder um, and I can tell you, from, and I've tried every, all the puppy foods out there with raising litters. This gives me the most consistent, best growth, not too fast, great neurologic development because of their, their balance of their medium chain triglycerides and their DHEA and their fatty acids. All of that is just a great blend. Excellent food for puppies. Um, small dogs, um, they do, and Purina has a whole line of, of small breed and large breed foods that are designed that way. And they're good for some, but some dogs don't do well on that. It's not the best for every dog. Um, I like Fromm's. Uh, Fromm's food is, um, but the one that's their their gold, I think it's Fromm's gold. Um, it's not grain free. And let me just really take a second and tell you, do not feed your dog grain free food if you don't have to. Very few dogs are allergic to grain and grain free food is indicated in heart disease in dogs. The research that there's a lot of information out there, but and the research to me is conclusive enough. The link between uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, a, a heart disease, and grain-free foods, specifically those with legumes like beans, peas, um, sweet potato, potato, um, and the first five ingredients or six ingredients is a no-go for me. I just would not risk it under any circumstances. Because, and until we have more information um, and because we see that heart disease develop in dogs that don't typically get it. So like, for example, Dobermans get dilated cardiomyopathy as a breed, but maybe let's say, um, you know, schnauzers don't. And now all of a sudden we see schnauzers getting this disease and all of the schnauzers that got the disease, they're on a certain number of grain free foods. The common ingredient in those grain free foods is usually peas or pea protein beans, legumes, legumes, you know, lentils, uh, potato, sweet potato in the first six ingredients. And the FDA came out with lots of warnings about it a couple of years ago. And, you know, it's, it's just one of those things until we have more info and it's being researched at many universities right now. And it, it basically, they think it creates a relative taurine deficiency in the body. So 
um, it's not enough to supplement taurine because the food doesn't let you absorb it. Though that protein doesn't, dogs weren't meant to eat peas. You know, that's just not the protein source they should have. So um, I like, I, so I tend to say no to the grain free unless your dog has a very specific allergy, you know, and in that case you can't really help it, but you have to do that. Um, I also like, um, let me think about it, Fromms, I like Purina. Royal Canin has got some good small breed. They have, what's kind of interesting with Royal Canin is they have breed specific food. So like they might have food that for miniature poodles or for schnauzers or for, you know, um, you know, border collies or whatever. They have a whole list of breed specific foods. And what's interesting about that is the research that they do is they make the kibble shape and size designed for the jaw and the conformation of that dog's mouth so that they can chew it and digest it easily. And so that's kind of cool. So, I mean, I like, I do, I have lots of dogs that do very well with Royal Canin. Um, I tend to stay away from, and I know a lot of people love blue and blue Buffalo. Um, I'm, I'm not a fan. I, I think the marketing is very deceptive. They've not handled recalls well over the years. Um, if you actually look at a bag of blue buffalo, it'll tell you that it's full of all these wonderful ingredients like, you know, blueberries, for example. And when you do the math in a 32 pound bag of, of blue, there's not even a whole blueberry in the bag, yet the bag has got lots of berries on it, you know? So it, it kind of bothers me as, as a, you know, as a consumer and as a veterinarian that, you know, it's not, it's really kind of deceptive. And so, I don't, um, I'm not a big fan of their foods and of that company. Um, but if you have a dog on it, that's doing well, you don't need to change that. Um, believe it or not, um, the veterinary nutritionist will tell you the most bang for your buck. If you are on a tight budget for food and you want high quality dog food, they say feed pedigree. That's probably the most bang for your buck that you can get. There's no, and most, some of the healthiest dogs I know have eaten pedigree for 20 years. I mean, there's nothing wrong or not 20, 15 years. There's nothing wrong with pedigree dog food. Um, it's a, it's, it's fine. It's a good food. People like to home cook a lot and there's nothing wrong with home cooking. Um, you can very easily cook for your dog. They can, they can subsist quite nicely on, you know, a lean protein and a carbohydrate source like rice. Um, they can, um, you know, just like you would feed yourself, you would want to feed your dog a well-balanced diet. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I would say not to do that while they're in a growth phase. I mean, because you want to make sure it's extremely well-balanced for growth, but certainly when they're an adult, if you want to cook for them, that's fine. And then for those finicky dogs, and that's always the hard one because there are dogs that are super finicky. Um, if you can't get your dog to eat anything at all, and you're really trying to get them to eat, not a, not my favorite food in the world because it's super rich and calorie dense, but I have a dog that won't eat anything but fresh pet consistently, you know? And so I buy that big old loaf of fresh pet and I chop it up and that's what he eats because, you know, he does well on it and there's nothing wrong with it. It's super pricey for long-term use, but he's only six pounds. So we're okay with it uh, for him, but he's an old guy and it works. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's no one size fits all, but the small, for small dogs, I like Fromm's. I think it does well. Um, you know, some people feed raw or they feed a freeze dried food. Um, I think you have to be very careful with raw diets. We see a lot of dogs that get sick from them uh, with salmonella or other pathogens. People get sick from those diets. Um, but in, in, if you have a picky eater, raw is probably not what they're going to want anyway. So um, if they're super picky, there's nothing wrong with giving them chicken breast and some rice and a little bit of veggie, like green beans or something like that. And if they're happy with that, there's nothing wrong with it. But I would try Fromm's or I would try, you know, maybe the uh, Royal Canin or Fresh Pet usually will work well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for the suggestions. So now this question may pertain to what we were discussing about CCD, but someone says, my 14-year-old dog is having issues mm -hmm. sitting up and sitting down, yep. slow and steady. Any supplement tips sure. would be greatly appreciated. So, um Probably an issue of arthritis, generally in an older dog, is the first thing we think about. Um, glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate can work, um, you know, as an oral supplement, but it has to go through the gastrointestinal system. It's not always the most effective, but it can help. You can try. Um, that's number one. Um, again, uh, vitamin E is a natural anti-inflammatory. Really good thing to do. That's over the counter. Um, that may not be enough, though. If they're really having that much trouble getting up and down, they may need some additional help from your veterinarian with like a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory or some additional medication. There's lots of options for treating arthritis in dogs. 
acupuncture works really well for dogs there. And if you go to a veterinary acupuncturist, they can also do herbs. And so if you're into more of the holistic side, works very, very well. Um, there are formulas there. You can do cold laser treatments and a lot of veterinarians have a cold laser that can be helpful. And then there's also Adequan um, injections, which I find are probably some of the best things you can do for a dog who's arthritic and painful. You do like two shots a week for two weeks and then you spread them out as needed after that. And many veterinarians will teach you how to do it for your dog and then just prescribe it for you. So you don't have to bring the dog in all the time. It's a very easy injection to do. It's under the skin, tiny needle. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Adequan. I think I, I see a lot of improvement on many of these dogs. And when I do acupuncture on a dog, I will often use Adequan as part of my acupuncture treatment. You know, we're all injected into the acupuncture points and it really does help. So um, there are, um, there's definitely a lot of um, like phytococ and some other supplements that, you know, people advertise. And most of them are green lip muscle, MSM, SAMe, glucosamine and chondroitin. And those are the components of what are good for arthritic dogs and then vitamin E as well. So those are kind of the, the overview of what I recommend. CBD sometimes can be pain relieving for these guys too. Um, so that's another, another option. So you've recommended vitamin E several times now. I mean, do you recommend that overall just as a good part of a, a dog's diet? You know, I recommend it as a natural anti-inflammatory. So if your dog is affected by things that have inflammation as a component, so skin disease, um, you know, any kind of, you know, orthopedic inflammation, those kinds of things, it's not going to hurt them. Certainly it's going to help keep the coat nice, skin nice, you know, just like, I don't know if you take fish oil caps or whatever, it's the same thing in people. It, it's really kind of a nice thing to do. Um, there's no, it's a, it won't do any harm, certainly, as long as you don't overdose it, you know, you don't want to give too much, but you do it appropriately for their weight. And I, it's, it's not going to hurt them at all. And I think, in, in fact, it can do a lot of help in most cases. So yeah, is I this on it. special caplets for dogs? Or is this the type you'd go to Walgreens and buy for yourself potentially? Okay, big dogs, use the human ones. If you have a little dog, I would get the veterinary specific because it's dosed appropriately. It's too hard to dose it for a small dog. They have um, one called Derm Caps um, that you can usually get. Some of them you can get over the counter too. Um, Nordic Naturals makes, you can actually do that and there's no prescription needed. Nordic Naturals has a, a liquid that you can dose quite easily for a small dog and just put it on their food. It's simple. Um, I love Nordic Naturals. That's one of the highest quality fish oils I know of. Okay, yeah, so that's, you'd have to get that from your veterinarian or you said you nope. could order it online? Online, just online. They have a website. I think you might even be able to get it on Amazon. Yeah, it's really good. Yep. Okay. Excellent, excellent product. All right. So we've got about eight minutes left. So I've got one question that'll round us out. And then I would just want to let people know um, how to find out more information about you. Okay. So let's see. It was this one here. What are signs of anal glands needing to be expressed besides smell and scooting? Those are the big ones. <laughs> you know, if you see your dog scooting its butt, anal glands need to be expressed. Anal glands, um, it, for those people who don't know, is, you know, if you, if they're right inside the anus, there are two little glands that sit on either side inside, inside the anus. And what happens is when a dog normally poops, those glands express. OK, they, so they should express on their own and you should not really need to express them at all. But when you have a dog that's scooting a lot, that means they're probably needing to be expressed. Or if they're licking at their bottom a lot, they probably need to be expressed. If your dog's breath smells like fish, like a nasty fish smell, they need to be expressed because that's they're licking and that's what's happening. There may be an infection or inflammation in there. Um, for dogs, because we've talked so much about supplements and things owners can do, for dogs with chronic anal gland issues, there is an over-the-counter supplement called Gland X. So you may want to put that up, Gland hyphen X, or G L A, maybe either G L A N D E X, I think. Um, and that is a supplement for dogs that have chronic anal gland issues that work really well. It won't cure every single dog, depending on what the underlying issue is. Sometimes it's allergy. Sometimes it's inflammation. There's a lot of things that can cause anal gland issues, infection, inflammation, allergy, but your dog shouldn't need to have its glands expressed very often. I mean, most of my dogs that are anywhere from, you know, seven months old to 14, I might've expressed anal glands twice in all, in like when I look at seven dogs in the last 10 years, I maybe two times I've had to do my dog's anal glands. It's not something you should have to do a whole lot, but 
if they are scooting, licking, the smell is bad, their breath smells really bad, like just horrific fish, definitely get their anal glands expressed. If the fluid that's coming out of them isn't normal, they may need treatment for that. But Glandex can help a dog that has some chronic issues for sure. Okay. So again, wonderful, wonderful information. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, and, yeah. You know, we've also had, because I know that you um, are involved with breeding dogs as well, we've had people actually email us for your information. Great. So I like to share it here at the end right. so that people can connect with you in regards to all of the other things that you offer. So okay. uh, your Facebook page is Supreme Point Kennels. Yep. And you yeah, can find Dr. It. Boyer online there. And uh, she also is a consultant a veterinarian. I don't know if you want to talk about that service at all. Sure. Um, I do offer um, for a fee. Um, if somebody wants to get a hold of me through the Facebook Messenger, that's fine. Or I can give you an email address. Um, and it's I do a consulting service where if you, let's say you wanted me to do a record review and give you a second opinion, or if you don't understand what's going on with your pet and you want to discuss that, spend some time talking about treatment alternatives and maybe there's something that, you know, whether your vet can't figure out what's wrong with your dog. Oh, there's my dog coming in. <laughs> anyway, so um, they missed you. <laughs> no, they do. If, um, so, you know, there are definitely some, um, you know, if you wanted to have like, a, like you and I have talked, you had a dog that you weren't sure about whether you needed to have a mask removed. And I went and looked yeah. at that for you and I'm like, you're right. It needs to come off. And, and, as it turned out, I mean, thankfully everything went really well, but it needed to come off, right? So um, I have no problem. You know, I'll, I'll either do a records review, I'll spend time talking to you about what your pet's condition really means, what you can expect. Maybe there's some other alternatives you haven't considered. Um, maybe you need help figuring out how to navigate a difficult circumstance, you know, with, with trying to find the right veterinary care for your pet, you know, whatever it is. So I do, uh, I do some freelance consulting, um, and I can do that by phone, by video or in person. Um, and they can message me through the Supreme Point Kennel site, or my email is, um, get a Griffin. So G E T A G R I F F O N at Gmail. I will not. Um, I will not just answer random vet questions at that email. Okay, if you want that one-on-one -on -one about your pet specifically, I have to establish that veterinary client-patient relationship for it to be legal for me to give you specific advice about your pet. Um, that's the, just the Veterinary Practice Act. So, for your pet specifically, you can ask for an appointment at that email. Be more than happy to set that up with you, whether it's by Zoom, Google Meet, however it works for you, or in person or if you want to set a time for records review and we can go from there. And of course you can always reach her through our website because we are happy to connect people and their pets. So, Thank you. so a couple comments came in and we get this every time, yep. Dr. Boyer, people are just so appreciative of your time and the answers and the tips and the resources. So thank oh, you again. Uh, keep an eye out on our calendar to find out when the next Ask Your uh, Ask the Veterinarian uh, broadcast will be coming up. It will most likely be late August because Dr. Boyer and I are both taking vacations. We're together. We definitely are. But we're finally going on vacations. <laughs> and obviously the dogs want their mom back. Yeah, they totally do. They're telling me it's time to play and time to walk. But Minnie That's right. Here's Minnie. So thank you, everybody, for your questions. Beforehand, if you did ask questions during this discussion, I will write them down for the next one so that we can get you to the front of the line. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Boyer, for your time. And I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.